Hi, I'm Laura. Hi, I'm Deanne. And I'm Philippe. Hi. And welcome to our Lyman Book Club. Uh, we are reading Pawn in Frankincense by Dorothy Dunnett. And we are on chapters 13, 14, and 15. Let's talk about how Dee and Philippe were dreading reading this book. <laughs> well, I don't know if dreading is the right word, but there's been some stuff here in uh, America that has not been so great in the past couple weeks. And the book is taking sort of a dark turn, uh, a very tragic turn. So, you know, before you start reading these chapters, you don't quite know what to expect. Um, fortunately, the first chapter of these three chapters wasn't so bad. And it had like a lot of evocative sort of descriptions of the landscape and like really kind of made me want to visit that corner of the world. But then everything went to hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. Um, so lately, like, lately over the past year, <laughs> um, I've really been pretty, pretty consistent in like trying to read and consume media that's rather light and fluffy <laughs> and like has, you know, happy endings and I just been doing a lot of like romance novel kind of stuff and just things that are not dark and heavy and depressing because I can't handle it. And this is the exception <laughs> to that. This is the exception to that rule. So I was just saying earlier this morning, I was sitting down to read these three chapters and it took me about an hour to like actually start reading them because I just thought, oh, what horrible thing is going to happen to some person I like or or a baby you know so but yeah the, the first chapter wasn't so bad so <laughs> Philippa goes on an adventure Yay. Yay. I always like, like the travel log aspect of this one day let's yeah. go on a road trip and uh sail around Greece oh my god yes please <laughs> I want to see Zakynthos and Thessalonica and all sort of, uh, Greece has always been top of my list of places to go, so. Yeah, I've still never been there at all. Um, any other thoughts on these chapters before we dive in? Um, I mean, nothing that we can't really discuss when we get into them, but there's some assumptions that our characters are making that I think are really dumb. Dumb, dumb, dumb. Like, super dumb. So uh, dumb. <laughs> Yeah, I, I gotta say, I'm not gonna believe that Gabriel is dead no. until he's been beheaded, the body has been burned, and the ashes have been scattered in moving water. <laughs> like, of, at that point, I will believe that this character is dead. Of but, course Gabriel's not dead, and I, yeah, can't, dead. No I can't believe that Lyman actually believes that. No. I think he's saying that on the surface, but he's gotta know. He's, no he's way. gotta know. Come on, Lyman. And there's is he actually going to take Jared's word for the fact that Gabriel's dead? Like, Jared is so unobservant. <laughs> like, right? There's no way. When does he ever take Jared's word on anything else? So, yeah. yeah. Well, there was also a part right before that where someone tells Jared that Gabriel died before the attack on Zuara, and he just believes it. Yeah, like, mm -hmm. Jared. <laughs> yeah the nephew, uh, Spazzy's nephew, does it. Yeah, it's just, yeah, there's there's no way, <laughs> so. It's like, stop it. underestimating this man. Yeah, they always do. Like, you should have known from everything that happened in the last book that he's always a step ahead of. So. Well, like 10 steps ahead. Well, yeah. I did love their big fight scene, though. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, that was really, really well done cinematic. I love sort of the battle and, like, the water that was just shallow enough to fight in, but just deep enough where like danger abounds. So it was really cool. And just like the eerie image of Lyman floating underwater and Gabriel floating on top and the sun rising and the water turning pink. Like, yeah. And the fact that Gabriel's life was saved by a cross of all things. I know the irony. Oh, of oh the bitter irony. Mm -hmm. all right. Should we dive in then? Yes. Dive in. All right, so chapter 13, Thessalonica. Um, so we start out with Philippa's road trip. She is traveling with Mikal um, in a group of about a dozen other people, including five other pilgrims of love. 
um, and they're following after the children of tribute. Um, in this first section, we learn that she started keeping a diary um, and we hear little bits of her diary. Um, we go through old Athens, but she does not get to explore it. Sadly, that would have been cool. Um, and she attends a wedding where she gives a gift. Um, and then the section ends as we're about to catch up with the children of tribute. Thoughts on this first section? Um, I liked just the little, like, I love the little sort of funny comments and little bits of like, I don't know, verbal irony and like dramatic irony or like just the sarcastic comments that she makes. And like, like there's, she does one about like, if she could have kept the bells to like, um, two major chords and a diminished seventh in G. <laughs> She's just like, like, cause the bells are super annoying to her and, and just little comments like that. I really love, <laughs> I kind of love her like ultra practicalness, but then every once in a while she's just like, oh, this thing. <laughs> so mm. that's nice. I, I enjoy the growth that we're really seeing in her character that she's like really independent and by herself. She's got nobody around her that she's known from her life before. The closest she has to anything is Mikal, who, you know, we, you know, she's only known like a day at the beginning of this chapter. And like, she's just taking these experiences and using her common sense and learning. And like, when she gets paid what she thinks is her first compliment ever by Mikal, mm -hmm. the calling her a four eyebrowed something, maybe that wasn't to her that it was speaking of, but she's like, she writes in her journal, she's like, I was just paid my first compliment ever. And then she says, I don't suppose it will go to my head. Right. And it's just like, oh. Yeah. Um, and I, it, you know, she said she says this more than once, but she's like, I don't know about love, but I know all about kindness. And I really loved that, that she's, it's not that she's devaluing love. I don't think she's saying that's not important, but I think this idea that, that she values kindness, um, I don't know it's it's a it's a thing that i feel like doesn't get enough attention like we should be kinder to each other and, yeah it is interesting how there is this recurring theme about love and kindness um and me talking about love and philippa talking about kindness um and he says he keeps ringing it up he says sometimes one must travel to find what is love um and he also tells her at one point i have opened the book of love i read and write in it you too shall read yeah well and they go to a wedding and they do you know like there's just there's just these things of you get this sense but you also like i feel like mikhail's version of love is not i mean he's a pilgrim like he's not who is he loving and what does he mean by that like it, it's some sort of ephemeral like good feeling towards people as opposed to like love is an action and a choice that you make every day over many many years to benefit someone else <laughs> you know like that's that's not the kind of love that Miguel is talking about and you know at its most shallow is he talking just about the physical act of love in which case like Philippa doesn't know that but she knows kindness and it just yeah yeah it is like a very um like again like very hippie like free love like the greeting that they give is let there be love and the answer is may thy love be beautiful so it's like this love is is bountiful and everywhere but how how serious can it be when it's just like yeah. you greet a stranger yeah it feels like so shallow and so surfacey and it's like we're just gonna we're just gonna like sprinkle love everywhere, yay! Um, as opposed to something that has depth and difficulty and hardship and joy and all that. So then, what did you guys make of this wedding, and and why is this in here in this moment? I just think it's a way on the surface to sort of highlight that you know even though these horrible things are happening in this corner of the world, there's still joy to be had. We've got this sort of town where like everybody's dirt poor, but they find reason to gather together and celebrate. And it's just this really sort of happy occurrence that happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And 
yeah, just these these traditions and there's a sense of like permanence, like even though everything changes, there's these things that are lasting. Um, I do love that Gideon said that snakes were appropriate for the Somervilles when she's talking about her the buckles that she gives this young bride and it's two snakes in silver. Um, therefore very seemly said Gideon for Somervilles. And um, yeah, it just seemed like it was this memory of her father that she gave to this young bride, which yeah, and I also love that, you know, she took the time to really try and understand this culture and like give a meaningful gift, even though the bride probably has no idea what they are and what she's going to use for them, except for the fact that they're silver, you know, that's a precious metal. But, you know, it, I don't think this is something Philippa would have done maybe a year ago if she had been in the same situation. She's just sort of grown from that petulant little brat who hated Lyman for absolutely well she had a good reason but like she just wouldn't let it go there's a line in the beginning about um it says she wondered in her waxing sophistication um and that, that idea of her waxing sophistication that she's growing and learning about the world and she's not the the naive kid that she was in the last book I think it's also interesting that she <clears throat> she's 16 and she has no expectation or seeming desire to get married. She wants to, like it says um, in her diary, she's talking to Kate, which I, I love. And she says, um, uh, you didn't ever happen to mention Kate, dear, whether you wish to start curing a son-in-law ready to lay in. <laughs> so I take it you don't. And of course, this is the image of her mother, like preparing some boy for her. I very much don't rather. I want to grow old and sour all by myself at Flaws Valley, modeled on my old and sour mother. Anyway, who could be sure of a husband in this country? And <clears throat> I kind of love that she's sort of like, she doesn't have romantic dreams of like, romance and some handsome young prince showing up at Flaws Valley and carrying her away to, you know, that's not in her, or at least she's not expressing that. Um, I think that the, that her destiny will not be to grow old and sour at Flaws Valley. <laughs> but, but as a 16 year old, I mean, when I was 16, I was like, super dreamy about stuff and she's just not which she seems to be a late bloomer also yeah i find it interesting that and i'm not sure if it's in this section or later in the chapter but she has a discussion with mikhail where he tells her she has the love of an old woman sort of like telling somebody like you have an old soul mm. where you know i think that's the kind of love that she learned from kate because she's never really had a chance to explore it on her own yet so mm -hmm. Yeah, they, thou knowest the love of old women. Um, the the four eyebrowed beauty I don't entirely get. It's it's a it's a boy who's hitting puberty, and so he's got the little like peach fuzz mustache, and so that's the four eyebrows. It's like the two and the two. But then why did someone call Philip for that? I don't know. And maybe like she's a teenager. Like I don't. Yeah, it's strange you think with the outfits she's wearing they may mistake her for a boy maybe but it said she's veiled mm -hmm. yeah. isn't it mikhail who calls her that i don't think so it doesn't say well no. i think it's some of the people no. that are traveling with her wow no. because there's several groups that sort of join in and then go off their own ways as she makes wow. her way to uh, Zach uh thessalonica sorry yeah thessalonica yeah, um, I also loved the description of just the people that like wandered into their group and wandered out of their group. And it's like, you know, we left this kid here and these people joined us here and then the, the vineyard owners came and then they left and they left us grapes. And they, it was just this like lovely, like journey of people joining and leaving and joining. And As I was reading this chapter and a little bit for chapter 15, which is the last chapter we read today, I had this mental image of the map 
in uh, the Indiana Jones movies where oh, there's yeah. like, a line the plane is taking as they like stop in all these different cities. Yes. And I was like, it just kept popping up because we go to so many places so quickly and like spend maybe a paragraph describing them, so. Mm -hmm. Well, and these are also like places with all kinds of archaeological ruins and, and interesting history and treasures. So it feels super Indiana Jones to me. Yeah. And I sort of love the fact that this is the 1500s and there everything is very ruined. And this is like, I think from my, you know, 21st century perspective, I always think of like, oh, that was so long ago. And, and, and yet their sense of antiquity was also very real and and, uh, you know, you Roman ruins and Greek ruins and... Yeah, we kind of talked about this before, like they're 500 years um, before us, but ancient Rome was like 1500 years before them. So it's yeah. still the ancient past to them, just like it is to us. Yeah, yeah. And I learned something, well, I learned a lot of new things reading this chapter, but I did not know that the happy birthday to you song was over 500 years old. I don't think it is. Is it not? <laughs> maybe, oh. maybe there was like a different version of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. The one that we sing is not that old because <laughs> right. it was, it's still been under copyright. Like it, it was written in the early 1900s. So yeah. And, but I'm sure that you sing songs for people's birthdays. Sure. It's just sure not. And it had an older version source that she yeah, had. It's not too amazing. That actually pulled me out of the story a little bit. I was oh, like, wait right. a See, second, that's not true. I just believed it right away. Me being gullible. <laughs> um, another thing that, uh, this chapter, and they use it throughout these chapters, is that the Khatun, I thought it was part of Kiai's name, but apparently yeah, it's, okay. uh, it's a title. Yeah, it's a title. Just like, what's the other one that keeps getting used? I don't know, I have to think about it. There's a title that um, they they call the men a lot. When we see I it. it yeah, I oh, don't yeah. know if it's these chapters, but I'll look it up quick. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to mention in this section, which is there's two bits that are kind of ominous in what is a pretty lighthearted section. Um, and one is when we're talking about the uh, the couple that's getting married. Um, and it starts out kind of lighthearted, like we note how young they are. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, how they're sort of part of this tradition of people that have been living lives like this for hundreds or thousands of years. Um, you know, he's going to fish just like they had done under the Caesars. Um, and then the last sentence in this kind of romantic depiction of these two young people as part of this history and culture for so long is, um, and when the time came, he would hand over, if he must, his most beautiful child to the commissars of tribute. Mm -hmm. The idea that it's just normalized and it's just part of their world that the, the children will be taken away. And then there's a bit later about how the bride's younger brother had been taken. Mm -hmm. um, and they just kind of celebrate it as you, you're gonna have a great opportunity. Um, and then the other thing that's ominous on the same kind of tone is at the very end of the section where Philippa talks about the child and she says, he'll have grown, they change a lot. And Mikal says, he may be dead, said Mikal. Hopefully, if he is dead, where shall we go? Yeah. Yeah, I still don't trust him at all, especially no. since he well, sort of disappears. Yeah. In the middle. yeah. I don't trust him at all. He's super sketchy. Like, he just, he just went away, <laughs> like. But let there be love. Um, any other thoughts on this section? I don't think so. I think the thing with, with Mikhail is that I don't trust his words. I want to trust his actions. And so far his actions have been um, convenient for him. Like he's brought her along on a trip that he was going to do anyway and then he hasn't seemed to have stepped out of his way to help her or protect her in any significant fashion so i'm sort of like hmm, i am withholding judgment on this person yeah <laughs> wait and see um okay so then the next section philip uh, goes really quick i did find the word i was looking for it's offending it's the uh, word that uh, a lot uh, of the characters are calling the men so uh -huh. Maybe this is why it reminds me so much of Indiana Jones. I used to play this Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis video game, and they would call Indiana Jones a Fendi. Oh. Anyway, I played that game. game. That game was really good for its time. It's amazing. I, I, I still play it sometimes, mm -hmm. every few years. Um, 
Okay, so next section. Um, Philippa goes to buy back the child. Um, the was it, chief commissar uh, refuses. He obviously knows who the child is and is expecting this. Mikal disappears, as you pointed out. That's not good. Um, and then Philippa leaves, and this janissary follows her. And um, eventually, she realizes that he's actually taking her um, for questioning to the Beglier Bee of all Greece. So, it's kind of a short section here. Thoughts on this? I was unsurprised <laughs> that she was. You know, it was going to be easy. <laughs> yeah, like. I'm like, okay, that didn't work. <laughs> I was not surprised that it didn't work. Um, yeah. That's really about my entire thoughts on that section. <laughs> I didn't note anything. I just like, obviously it's creepy that Mikhail disappears. Yeah, it's creepy that Mikhail dis disappears. I like that she's at the end with this janissary guy that she says, she's like, I want to stop now. You know, she, she's kind of going along with it for a little bit. And then finally she's like, no, we're done. And then that's at that point, he's like basically kidnapping her, you know? And, and it was that sequence actually, that page 244, where her vulnerability really came through. Like she is completely vulnerable in this situation. She's 16. She has very little, if any, fighting skills. She's got some money, but it's like people know she has money and anybody can steal it from her. She's like, like she's just super vulner vulnerable. And so I began to get very nervous for her at the end of this section. And there's no political like protection for her really because she's English and the English are allied with Spain and Spain is the enemy of the Turks. So, yeah. I'm also more worried for her now because while I wasn't sure how much Gabriel knew about her before, he definitely knows about her now because we find out that Shimi Wormit sort of goes to Gabriel and tells him everything, whether he just does it or he was coerced into doing it. But mm -hmm. Gabriel now knows that Philippa, if he didn't already know before, he now knows that she's searching for one of the children as well, so. Yeah, I assume Shimi was tortured to death by Gabriel, but who knows, maybe he coerced him and then killed him. Yeah. Um, okay, so in our next shocking section, um, Philippa goes to the Beglier Bees um, where she speaks to a Bektashi Baba um, who tells her that the kid here is Gabriel's son that she's trying to buy. Um, and she tries to convince him that it's Lyman's and Lyman being French, allied with the Turks, give him to me because it's good for the Alliance. Um, he says, well, the, we'll sort it out in Constantinople, um, which is where the kid is headed and also where Lyman is headed. Um, Philippa then meets the child's caretaker, which it turns out to be, surprise, Evangelista Donati. Um, and she meets the child himself, who's called Kuzukayam. Um, and Evangelista Donati convinces Philippa that the only way to protect the child is to give herself into the Sultan Suleiman Seraglio. <laughs> I just want to go, what? Which of course but she does. Join the harem. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. Uh, I, I, I did, there's, um, I love this paragraph. I didn't love it. It was a beautiful paragraph on 246 at the top where um, she's talking, Philippa is thinking about um, the culture around her. And she says like, all right, they liked flowers. They liked music. They liked animals and birds. You never saw a badly used dog in the negraneries of Cairo. So they said, we're never close from the sky so that pigeons might feed when they choose. But they killed by ganching and slicing and cautery and by doing what they had done to the woman Uno Dwyer. And so it's just this contrast, which we've seen a lot in the book so far, but this contrast between things that are kind and or beautiful and yet horrific. So it's like there's this beauty, kindness, and horror. It's all blended. Yeah. All blended in with delicious peach jam. Yeah, which they're walking through. I know. Both the goats and the kids. <laughs> just like ew. yeah let's talk about the um imagery associated with the child the the lambs and the peaches what does that mean why is that there well i definitely think the imagery around this kid is meant to convince us that this one is 
Jolita and Gabriel's kid. Like, yeah. why? Just like fruit and de- like sort of like decayed fruit kind of images, you know, and 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 things like that. Um, I mean, on symbolism alone, we had a whole book where uh, Jolita and Gabriel just were described with apricot hair and you know, the poisonous pit of the peach within. And like here we have this child around peaches. So mm-hmm. that speaks to some symbolism, so. Yeah. Literally the first the lambs, the child is- Maybe the lambs has something to do with innocence. Because yeah. this is an innocent child, whether it's Kuzakoyam or Karedin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's really telling that the, literally the first image we have of this child is the child like falling into this peach jam and being covered in peach jam. And like you said, mm-hmm. Jolita, peach, and apricot images were happening throughout the previous book. Yeah. I mean, at this point, I'm probably leaning towards this kid is Gabriel and Jolita's, and the other little kid is Lyman's, I guess. But we could be being tricked by. <laughs> <laughs> they were both under Dragut's um, harem's care in Algiers, and then they got sent out. So while they originally, when they originally sent, they were definitely, this was Kuzakoyam and the other one was Karedin, but they could have been switched at any time. Yeah, there's this really ambiguous thing about like maybe they were switched because the, this one was like sickly when he went there and came back healthier. Mm-hmm. But but also like that that's not proof that uh, yeah. that it was a different kid right it's it's still right. like left really ambiguous yeah I mean Marine doesn't Evangelista swear that this is Karedin isn't she so and can we trust her well so it's really interesting to watch what happens between Philippa and Evangelista Donati because the first thing that Philippa says is um, I'm from Mr. Crawford, I've come to buy back his son. So Evangelista knows that Philippa is wanting to save this kid because she thinks it's Lyman's. So whether Evangelista knows it is or isn't, she's not gonna say if it isn't because she wants the child to be saved. True. Right. Yeah, that's just my thought too. As soon as Philippa said that, I was like, oh no, you just showed your hand. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. and, and so, yeah, like, why do we believe anything that Donati says if her goal is to save this little kid, which if the kid is Jolita's, like, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I, you yeah, know, Philippa like, assumes that she's protecting the kid because she is, like, angry at Gabriel. But it would make mm-hmm. much more sense if she's protecting the kid because it's Jolita's and she loves Jolita or she loves yeah. Jolita. Yeah, that was my assumption, which is why I think... I'm more likely to say this kid is Jolita and Gabriel's is because that makes sense that Donati would be loyal and protective of that child. Is Philippa even aware at this point that there are two children? No. Right. Like, does she maybe remember it from before, but she's not thinking, she hasn't ever thought about it. Right, because she's really got this one track sort of goal of saving Karedin. Yeah. Um, and yeah, she's literally told this child is a child or godson of a knight of St. John. So we're getting a lot of hints here. And then the description of the child's birth was like 100% definitely Jolita. So the only question is, was it swapped when it went to Algiers? Right. Right. Um, but then the kid himself comes in, the child of the peach jam, and he's so sweet, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, which is, which I think is something that came, comes up in the next, next chapter, chap, the third chapter, again, where it's, it, it's talking about like this kid, Gabriel and Jolita's kid seems to have escaped the, what, how did they put it? I mean, we can talk about it when we get there, but, but he's, I think it's Jared who's talking, thinking about, he's escaped the, basically the evil nature of his birth. You know that if if the child is physically healthy, then he's escaped the sort of genetic flaws possible. With yeah, him. let's talk about it more when we get there. It's Lyman. It's one of our rare. Lyman's. Oh, it's Lyman's doing it. Okay, yeah. 
I underlined it. I just couldn't remember who did it. But yeah, it's, but I think that's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting assumption because th there would be an assumption that a child of incest would be like damaged spiritually. Like there's some sort of like evil imprint on the kid. So it'll be interesting to see if Dunnett plays that out. I don't know. Yeah. We're also, when we get the description of the child, um, he was square built and solid. And we always get these depictions of Gabriel as being like this big, solid guy, bigger than Lyman. Um, and we have the peach imagery again. He was firm as a hard peach. Um, just saying. Well, and also symbolically, I mean, the other kid is being used sexually in the way that Lyman is and this one is not, which is another connection. Yeah, I feel like it's very clearly in like the imagery and in the themes and in the, like the parallels that abused child is being associated with Lyman and this healthy peachy child is being associated with Jolita. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, here's a question I have now, and it may be that we don't have an answer yet, but something to think about. Why did the Dame du Dutant send her here to chase after this child instead of Caradine? Mm -hmm. This is a great question. Why do you think? Uh, I mean, I think it's going to have something to do with what comes later, whatever comes later. But I think tracking down both children is definitely important to undoing Gabriel. Mm -hmm. If that's what the Dame du Dutant is trying yeah. to do. Like, I don't feel like we know what she wants. No. Like, what is her goal? So until we have some sense of what her motivations are, I have no idea. But I definitely got another sense of like the Dom sort of knowing what's coming in this chapter, because when uh, Philippa initially visited, she sat her down and said, uh, here, have some coffee. It's like, you've never had this before, but you will grow a taste to it eventually. And like here in this chapter, we have Philippa's next sort of trial by fire and i say that because i hate coffee myself but like where she sits and drinks coffee and like she's been prepared for it almost like the dom knew that this day would come when i mean she's also sending her to this area of the world where they drink coffee a lot so it could just be a tiny little thing but i see it as like a way of the dom being like this is going to happen to you so i'm preparing now no totally that makes sense i never thought about that but that makes perfect sense yeah there's also a couple little tidbits of just a sense of how Philippa is thinking through how she's interacting with people here in this chapter, where well, there's one where she's remembering instruction from Kate, where Kate says, attack little flower, which I love that. And then, and then Kate says, answer rude questions with naive questions as near to the bone as you can get them. And so just Kate giving her instruction on, when you are in a place of powerlessness, <laughs> little flower, like here's how to attack. And then there's a point later where she says, um, it says like mice whipping cheese from a trap, thoughts flash through her head. <clears throat> and so just this idea that she's, and we've seen this before where she's like rapidly thinking through what she's gonna do next before she does something. Um, and I really love that contrast with particularly Jared, who doesn't think through anything at all. And so Philippa might make the wrong choice, or she might make a choice that's like maybe she doesn't have all the information, or she's not able to make a choice that's beneficial. But but at least she's like thinking through all of her options and choosing the best one that she can. So. Speaking of Philippa's choices, she makes a somewhat questionable choice here. I think inspired by Aunt Evangelista Donati, who's going to die for this child, Philippa concludes that giving up her life permanently into the Seraglio um, until she dies is worth it to save this child. Yeah. And she also makes some assumptions about what's happened that are just like, why do you think that's what's happened? Yeah. She's thinking that that will keep her and the child safe from Gabriel, but like, Gabriel has no honor. Like, why do you think this, yeah. like he could like sneak somebody into the Sultan's palace and have you executed? She yeah, and, or why she thinks going into this court in a, like, why this is a good idea makes no sense. Like, this is bad, 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 bad. 
but she's also 16 and she sees this vulnerable little kid and so it's kind of like the the good that she can do that's in front of her is I think m pulling her strong more strongly than other goods you know like other things that are good so it's it's like the thing that is right in front of her face she can't let go like well, she's gone so far she ran away from home she's traveled all around the world she went off you know she's supposed to go home and instead she went off um looking for this kid and she's all on her own and like it would all be worth nothing if she just was like oh not worth it to save this kid right never mind yeah yeah and interestingly there's another little description of this kid on right before the end of the chapter where it says um that it's talking about like how well fed he is and da, da, da. it says the face close to hers laughing was nothing but monstrous blue eyes and you're like hmm <laughs> monstrous blue eyes it's not cornflower blue eyes no so yeah and she will never escape this seraglio you don't leave the Sultan Seraglio unless you're going to get married, I guess, to the best blood in the land. On the plus side, um, Suleiman's old and he's not going to actually sleep with any of the women in his harem. So, yay. Okay. <laughs> so does that mean that Philippa's going to have to marry somebody to get out of this Seraglio thing? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Or will she just be rescued at some point? I don't know. Do you think Lyman is going to have to rescue her out of this harem by marrying her? Like, <laughs> uh, it's a possibility. 16 year old Philippa. But how would Lyman be the best blood in the land? I don't know. I just, <laughs> it's just a bonkers choice that would be like, you know. Well, I mean, this is assuming that she makes it to. Constantinople without anything else happening. So who knows? That's true. true. But I mean, they're all going to end up there together in the end, it feels yeah. like, because now we've got three sort of different groups traveling. So yeah. yeah. Well, anyway. All right. Any other thoughts on that yeah. chapter? Oh, Philippa. Growing, getting better, but still making silly, foolish choices. Yeah. She's like, oh, she's standing by her you know, by her force of will, she's doing what she thinks is right for the child, which you can't disrespect. Yeah, I remember being 16 and it was very difficult. So the fact that she's doing it under some really trying circumstances and, you know, not making the best choices necessarily, but doing her best and learning and growing. And this I, mean, I made some dumb decisions when I was 16, so <laughs> dumb. This choice she made, may be the thing that keeps this child alive. We don't know yet. So this is probably a, still a foolish choice, but the right choice. So I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. And maybe it's not foolish. Maybe it's just, maybe it's, it's just self-sacrificial. And at 16, she has the wherewithal to say, I will give up what I give up to save this kid. That's awfully like another character in this book, being self-sacrificial. <laughs> True. Yeah. All right. We learned from the best. <laughs> I mean, it is interesting that there's a point later in this story, in those chapters where Lyman says that the only life we're sacrificing for this child is his. And Philippa is actively sacrificing her life for this kid. Yeah. How is Lyman going to react? Mm -hmm. All right, chapter 14, Zuara. So we start out in Leone Strozzi's point of view, um, where he is preparing to take Zuara um, to kind of cement his uh, likelihood of becoming the next Grand Master of the Knights of St. John, because uh, Deomedes is getting old and his only rivals are little Valette and Gabriel. Um, we learned that he tried to take Gabriel down, but of course, uh, nobody uh, believed him because he's got such an obvious motivation. Um, he is a very unreliable narrator because he's thinking how all these weird accidents keep happening, but it can't possibly be Gabriel's fault, when of course it's Gabriel's fault. It's exactly what Gabriel did to Lyman. 
Um, then Jared arrives um, and we end up switching to his point of view. Um, the first thing that happens is that he is nearly killed by Gabriel, um, which is our, our reintroduction to Gabriel in this book. Um, and he's trying to warn them that uh, the Turks are expecting the attack um, and it's all a setup to actually attack the Knights um, and that they have landed 12 miles too far east of where they're supposed to be. And then we end this section on that scary note. Thoughts on this? Gabriel's dick? Like, I mean... <laughs> scary. He's really scary. Yeah. But that scene in the water with with Jarrett was just, yeah. The word she uses, tenderly reaching out one muscular arm and placing it relentlessly. It is no use. I'm afraid you must drown. Thank God yeah. the other guy saw him and knew who it was. Yeah. It's like this close. Yeah. And it's just it, like Gabriel's, um, like he's rather dispassionate about killing Jarrett. It's like, I'm sorry that I have to do this, but I do. Yeah. And be pushing him under the water, you know, and, and there's this guy who was loyal to him for a long time and adored him for a long time, you know, and, and, uh, that means nothing to Gabriel. Yeah. And he doesn't, he's just so yeah, dispassionate and like, it must be done. I mean, he didn't even have respect for his sister. Why would he have respect for any respect right. for Jared? So. I mean, he doesn't have any respect for anybody, but it just the, the, his outlook on the world is just the only things that are important are what matter to him and fulfill his needs and everything else is worthy of dismissal. And yeah, I think it's interesting that a few times we get descriptions of Lyman as a machine, but we know he's not, that he's got a, a real depth of emotion underneath. And then in contrast, we have Gabriel who acts like he has all this emotion, but he really is like a machine. Like he's really sociopathic. He doesn't actually have any emotions that are genuine as far as we can tell, aside from like pride and rage. He has no empathy whatsoever. Like he has literally zero empathy and... Yeah, it's just sad. So Gabriel is the one that sort of takes out this fishing boat without knowing that Jared is on it. Is this something that he learned from Shimi Wormit when he either tortured him or coerced the information out of him? I don't think Shimi would have just gone to Malta and told him everything. I, I definitely agree. I think he was tortured, but. Well, yeah, he ends up dead. I mean. Yeah. Yeah, my I assumption know. was that he wouldn't just be like, hey, you know give me some money and I'll tell you what I know. Like, I'm sure he, he seemed like a good guy, right? So it's not like he was working with Gabriel the whole time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't think so. He's just a random guy that they were quarantined with. Yeah. So Gabriel just sees this fishing boat, knows that Lyman, of course, knows about the attack on Zwara and makes his move just to yeah. make sure that nothing gets in the way. Yeah, I assume he... He, yeah, I assume he just like knows that Lyman or Jared is coming. And so he sees the fishing boat and he's like, well, better destroy it. And like, you know, being super powerful, super evil, maybe he likes saw Jared's head in the distance or something. Who knows? Yeah. I mean, spy glasses existed. So, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, nice. Yeah. But I think also um, there is this line about how um, after the unexpected death of Shimi, um, Gabriel had been a shade abstracted through his pretentious posturings. Um, so I think that was like the moment where Gabriel found out like, oh, um, you know, this thing with the knights is not going to work. I need to go over the Turkish side for sure. Mm -hmm. um, him to change his plans. And he's probably learning some stuff that the Lyman contingency got a little bit further than he expected them to. Like, I, I literally don't know up to this point if he knew about, you know, uh, Philippa and her journey through Greece. Right. Or if that was just another trap set for Lyman eventually, right. like a second contingency. Yeah. yeah. Um, I also think it's really telling that Lyman didn't want to give the papers to Strozzi because he knew that no one's going to believe that guy. Um, 
and we find out that he was in fact totally right um and nobody believes that guy and it was of course Jarrett who um was like oh just give him the papers anyway you know um never listen to Jarrett um and then just the 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 irony the statement from um De La Valette who's like he can surely knew, do no great harm <laughs> like right. everyone under estimates Gabriel yeah we'll just keep an eye on him it'll be fine <laughs> like no 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 but at least there's one person sort of in the order that has the wherewithal to admit that it might be a problem True. And, and De La Valette, um, if you remember, I said before, when we read um, Sorley Nights, that the capital of Malta is called Valletta. So, mm -hmm. you know, he's going to be an important guy eventually. Yeah. Well, I mean, considering at the end of this chapter, Gabriel is dead. And Juan, not Juan, um, Leona Strozzi, because of this attack, his reputation in the Nights is severely, severely diminished. I think we know who the next Grand Master is going yeah, to be. Yeah, it's going to be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. That seems yeah. reasonable. Yeah, so after these books happen, there's famously um, the Great Siege of Malta in, I think, 1565, led by De La Valette, who kept them safe from, like, massive attacks, and that's why he is still, like, famous there. There's statues of him, and the town's named after him. His presence, when you visit, is very felt. Hmm. Is this um, failed attempt to take Suara an actual historical thing that happened? I'm sure that it was. <laughs> I figured. Especially if Strazi, Strazi's a real guy, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So then it's gotta be. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Which makes me wonder, is the 12 miles off course thing just people being dumb or did somebody else actually betray them, <laughs> you know? So yeah, I, don't, I didn't actually like do any research on this, but I wouldn't be surprised if they really did just by accident land 12 miles right. off and then, you know, Donna took it and was like, Gabriel made that happen. Yeah. Somebody like accidentally navigated them wrong or something. Exactly. I mean, as this chapter progresses, and we can get into this later, but like all these sort of awful things happens to the knights. I was like, oh, well, they weren't the greatest yeah. people either. True. Yeah, I will say I wasn't that invested in the battle. I was no. just kind of like, eh, okay. Everybody's I was like, scared. even Strozzi was like, I'll give you two gold pieces for every Moore's head that you bring. Yeah. It's like, well, that's not great. <laughs> no, I think, I mean, I think Donna has always been like really ambivalent about the knights. And like, she makes it really clear here. Like they, they, they and were like the men that they have hired or whatever, just like loot the town and rape the women and like, yeah, nothing admirable about that. Also kind of stupid. Like they're showing up in the town and nobody's there. You know, like there's no soldiers in this town. And it's like, and everyone's kind of like, oh, whatever. It's just empty. And you're like, yeah, no, surprise. I am an American woman in the 21st century. And I immediately know this is not a, <laughs> this is not how towns work. Like, um, yeah. One other thing I thought was just really telling about Gabriel is the way that he's so like, again, mechanical, like he, he wants mm -hmm. to kill Jarrett to get him out of the way. But then when that becomes difficult, he like grabs his broken wrist and makes him pass out. And then he doesn't kill him. He leaves him alive um, because it, it, it's uh, what, what's necessary for his purpose is just to have Jarrett out of the way long enough for Gabriel to do his thing in the battle. So it's not even like vengeful. There's not even like real emotion behind wanting to kill Jared or not wanting to kill Jared. It's just what is convenient for Gabriel. End of story. Hello, cat. <laughs> I think Gabriel comes to regret that decision later. That Jared, in some way, is a part of his downfall. So. Yeah. I love our cat visitors. Yeah, I will say I had a visceral reaction to that wrist thing. Oh. <laughs> God. It's like, as, as Lauren Fleet know, I shattered my wrist several years ago into multiple pieces. And just the thought of somebody grabbing it, it's just like, that just, I was like, oh, I can see why he passed out. I mean, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, it brought back bad memories. Yeah, I was like, talk about bad memories. <laughs> it's not good. Yeah. Uh. Um, okay, so the next section is a little interlude here. Um, mm -hmm. Jarrett thinking about the plan uh, 
and um, how uh, Lyman is probably going to kill Gabriel and how Gabriel deserves to die. Um, thoughts on this interlude? Oh, when he's thinking about like the gap between him and Lyman, how far apart they are now. Mm -hmm. um, like Gabriel or Jarrett's this this gap between him and Francis, you know how separated they are, and and um, he talks about like how much damage Lyman himself willfully caused in the last weeks to the relationship existing between them. Um, and then, and then he goes on to say, like, Lyman is hard and self-contained. His intelligence shut against all life and all humanity that did not concern his one purpose. And of course, we know that Jared only sees the surface. Like, he doesn't see the turmoil and pain and conflicted nature of Lyman. So, but the idea that Lyman, whatever he's doing is, like, actively destroying his relationship with Jared, or at least that's what Jared perceives. And well, yeah, and it's like almost it's exactly what we we're saying Gabriel's actually doing this just like turn off all humanity and focus on your one purpose. And it's not what Lyman is doing, but it's what he's like trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and like you said, Jared only sees the surface. Also, the damage Lyman willfully caused in the last week seems to be mainly the whole sleeping with the Agamorat thing. Which of course we know was to protect Jared, and Jared is just an idiot, a jealous idiot. Yeah, <laughs> to be clear, a jealous, like, lovesick idiot. Yeah, I love it. I, where is it? Somewhere in here, he talks about how he thought thousands of times about the. There's one point where he says something about how he thought thousands of times about um, what. Uh, Marta said about why he loves her. <laughs> like Marta accusing him of being in love with Lyman and he's thought about it thousands of times. And he keeps blocking it from his memory. Right. Like, and he like, can't bear it. And it's like, dude, come on. This is think, capital D denial. I think yeah. it's in the next chapter, but I know the exact moment you're talking about. Yeah, it's like, so you're thinking about it like every five minutes since it happened? <laughs> it can't possibly be true. Yeah. yeah. All right, um, next section. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so as we were talking about the knights way too easily get into the town of Zuara, um, which is full of old men, women, and children, but they just decide to plunder and loot instead of going, hmm, maybe it's a trap. Um, Lyman uh, does warn them that it's an ambush um, and they are indeed ambushed by uh, the Agamorath's men. Um, Lyman stops Jarrett from killing Strozzi because Strozzi is the one wearing the blue panache instead of Gabriel. Um, and then Lyman doesn't engage in the battle. He just goes hunting for Gabriel, like preserving his energy. Um, and then we have this horrible moment where we discover that Gabriel has switched sides. He's now fighting with the Turks. He cold-bloodedly uh, uses this to advantage to get Strozzi's nephew to just come right up to him and then kills him. Um, and then Gabriel and Lyman have their, their big fight to the death where uh, Gabriel reveals that there are two children, as we had already known, um, one of Lyman and Una, the other child of Gabriel and Jolita, and then um, Gabriel dies and um, Lyman is rescued by Jarrett. And I love this moment, actually. There's this amazing moment where the Agamorat's men will kill Lyman and Jarrett, and the Agamorat stops them because of his feelings for Lyman. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ew, uh, but also. Yeah. <laughs> I had another ode to George Lucas moment in the beginning of this chapter where I figured there should just be this Admiral Akbar character that's standing there screaming, it's a trap. <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of uh, Lyman and Jared in this in this chapter. <laughs> yeah, but they don't get the warning out quick enough. Um, Not yeah, like they didn't try. Yeah, there's these wonderful moments of, of just like bitter irony, right? You mentioned like Gabriel being protected from the stabbing by the cross. And then the fact that it's the Agamorat who saves Lyman and Jared. 
Um, and also just the awful way that the, the Strozzi nephew dies. Um, it's just like, it's just really eerie. It's like a nightmare chapter. Yeah. So that would have been Piero's son? Yeah. The other Strozzi, yeah. That's sad. Yeah. Yeah, and then I love the way that Dunnett does these um, sort of verbal irony bits throughout. She does it all over, but there's a lovely one where on 266, um, where it says, um, it was when they discovered this that the army of Malta regrettably ran amok. It was not, of course, the fault of the magist magistral knights and the knights of grace, the chaplains of obedience, the serving brothers, the pilliers, the priors, the bailiffs, or the knights grand cross of the order. And you're like, it was absolutely their fault. <laughs> it just runs through all these titles of these great like titles of Christian militaristic might, you know, and how it was not, of course, their fault when, of course, it absolutely is their fault. And we know it's their fault. And it's these this, you know, the mighty hand of God is doing horrible things. And yeah, she is very, very critical of them in a super like ironic way. I also found it really telling that Strozzi is in a line to become the head of the Knights, which is a religious order on a crusade effectively. And yet he's also moonlighting as a pirate that like just takes lots of ships for plunder. Yeah. And that's totally fine. I think they need their gold from somewhere. Yep. Yay piracy. I mean, it's weird. Um, and then, uh, you know, we've talked about this, but there's this image of, um, ruined innocence or shattered innocence and I feel like comes out really clearly in the Strozzi nephew where he's like innocently recognizes Gabriel and has this look of happiness on his face to realize that Gabriel is still alive and then that's what Gabriel uses to just casually like stab him through the heart and kill him. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He leaned forward amiably and plunged it through the boy's heart. Yeah. Amiably. Yeah. It's like kindly stabs him. Yeah. And he rode past Jarrett in order to do that. Surprised he didn't just kill Jarrett when he had the chance to. Although we've already seen that he just doesn't really care. Yeah. Maybe it was a direct sort of way of getting to Strozzi. It's like, well, I'm going to kill this guy's nephew. I mean, I adding think... insult to the injury, I've already destroyed his reputation with the Knights. Gabriel just doesn't care about Jarrett at all because Jarrett is not the one who should have, like Jarrett fell at his feet. Jarrett did what he was supposed to do, you know, and adored him and all of that. And so it's like, it's Lyman. Lyman's the only one. And he says this at one point when we're in Gabriel's perspective where it's like, Lyman's the only one who should have been at his feet and should have been adoring him and isn't. And so he's the only one he cares about. Yep. That whole discussion that they have right before the fight was like, why did you not fall at my feet and adore me like all the others? Yeah. Like, what is it about you? It's like, and he calls him his swan. And I was like, Jesus. Yeah. Gross. Well, and I think but, it's really, oh, go ahead. I just say everybody else is just a means to an end. And if, if he doesn't need to, like, he doesn't kill Jarrett because he doesn't care. Mm. Well, and I think it's really telling that Lyman makes an extremely witty comment. Um, he, they're talking about Marta. He says, who can tell about the beautiful Marta since she is not signed in the genitive? Um, and makes Gabriel burst out laughing. And that's where he's like, my God, my God, why alone are you not my slave? Like Gabriel likes him or is attracted to him or whatever, admires, recognizes his capability and his wit. And it just drives him nuts that he can't have that, you know, serving his purposes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Gabriel knows something about Marta, clearly. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you about, yeah. He says, mm -hmm. in fact, I may say, you may no more unlike me than I may unlady your mother. Tell me about the beautiful Marta, like immediately after saying he's going to like expose mom. So he clearly knows something about this that Lyman doesn't. Mm -hmm. Or he... Or he just wants to hurt. Yeah. Or he just knows there's something there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's hard not to see how similar they are. So, but I don't know if Gabriel has ever seen Marta, unless it's something that we just don't know about yet. 
I mean, he obviously has like spies reporting to him on the people that Lyman's traveling with, and someone is like, "Hey, she looks just like him." Um, but yeah, we don't know for sure that it means anything about Sibylla, actually. But right. there's that like where there's smoke, there's fire kind of thing, and and I think Gabriel either he knows something that Lyman doesn't, or he just knows that that's what's most likely to hurt Lyman, just by um, you know implying bad things about Sibylla. Yeah, he knows. He knows that there is something. He knows the stories abound, you know. So, yeah. I found it interesting that um, they go through this bit about the two children. Um, and Gabriel's like, never on this earth will you distinguish them, nor is there any person now living who knows one child from the other. And then he says, um, one is your son, the other is mine and Jolita's. And then that is. The next line is, however strong the self-discipline for every man, there is a point beyond which the impulse to kill will not be denied. Gabriel knew Francis Crawford. So he says that deliberately because he knows it will like cause Lyman to lose it, which it does, although not in the way he expects. Mm -hmm. But it's so interesting that it's the child is mine and Jolita's is what makes Lyman just like, that's it. <laughs> like he cannot stop him from trying to kill Gabriel at, anymore. So why do you think that's what um, does it? And that is super interesting. Like, is it, is it that Lyman, is it that Gabriel preyed on Jolita and that, and Lyman knows, like, even though she was horrible, he also knows that she was a victim. And so it's that reminder of, of Gabriel's like victimizing of his sister that causes Lyman to lose it. Yeah. I think it's also partly that, you know, this is the first time Lyman sort of come to the terms that there are two children and Gabriel has made it even harder for him to track down his own child now. And just like the absolute malice and evil of this man to like maybe go through all this. And now here's another obstacle he's thrown in my way. Yeah. And also the idea that like, if he get, saves the wrong one, it's this like incest child is pretty horrifying as well. And just the idea that like, they gave us so casual about it. Like, yes, I had a baby with my sister and I'm using it against you, LOL. And if he does yeah. only save one and not the other, how will he ever know which one is which? If they're really that similar. Yeah. Also, I think it's interesting that Gabriel says no one alive knows which is which, but I think Evangelista Donati does know, mm -hmm. but he has arranged to have her poison, so she's about to be dead if she's not already. Yeah. Yeah. And she oh, also mentioned that when she was with the child, that up to a certain point, Gabriel didn't know that she was there. Yeah. So. I do think it's a little bit weird that there's this insistence that two children will absolutely not look like anyone in their family ever like i think that kind of is a little bit not like like if they can save both of these kids it does seem reasonable that at some point at least one of them is going to look like a family member like just that's how it works so no it's true but like but like what's the practical implications of that how do you raise them until you know they may not show who their parent is until they're like 12 or something and do you just like pretend they're both Lyman's kid until you see that one of them looks like Gabriel and then you kick that kid out of the family like, you can't do that or you, just, or you just like raise two kids like <laughs> yeah but then at that point it doesn't matter which one looks like which yeah right right but it's just like there's sort of like this taunting of like you'll never know and it's like oh i think they're gonna know at some point <laughs> but well, it doesn't have to matter like it doesn't have to matter if they don't let it but it's just the onus of now having to save two instead of one because if he only does save one he's not gonna know for years if he picked the right one you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean what if he makes his best guess and then you know, many years later, it's like, oh, crap, he doesn't look like me. He looks like Gabriel. And also, this shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, but this is just Gabriel showing, like, yeah, he's my kid, and I don't give, Yeah. I don't have any cares at all. Yeah. It's like, whatever. 
I think that like, might be my own child is just another pawn in this game now too. So I think that might be what set Lyman off, just the absolute lack of care for his own child. Because mm -hmm. we see how much Lyman cares for his child, even though he tries to hide it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's also just this great image of Gabriel that I liked where um, uh, Graham Mallet sat still in the saddle, the fire striking sparks from the gold of his turban. And I just love that, like, he's like the devil, you know, it's like he's a, the devil in hell with the fire and the sparks. She's not pretending anymore that he's holy. <laughs> not at all. Ugh. And then what do you even after this chapter? What? And then, and finally, even the knights won't believe it after this chapter is over. So yeah. what do you make of his statement? I am going to hurt you, but I am not going to kill you just yet. You are going to provide me with a great deal of merriment still. He's still got plans in motion. Like he's, he's a terrible person. <laughs> like <laughs> But yeah, Philippe's right. It's it's he's got plans and he's he's too he's so full of himself and his own importance and his own, you know, internalized justification for everything he's doing that but Lyman is like a challenge and a rival and a you know potential whatever and he doesn't want to let go of like, hey, there's this guy who's almost my equal, you know? Yeah. Okay. And Gabriel and Gabriel enjoys this. He enjoys threading him along. Like, this is part of the game, the part of the thrill, which is just another reason why there's no way Gabriel's actually dead. Yeah, no way. No. No, yeah, his, he's sadistic and, and finds delight in torturing others. And so he just wants to continue to entertain as long as possible. Yeah, I feel like it's also like the dark mirror of a love story where it's like, I finally found my match. Um, I want to think about this person all the time. And it's like, I found my match. I want to think about him all the time and destroy him and make him suffer in the most creative ways possible. <laughs> Show how much I love him by how creatively I destroy everything in his life and break him down into tiny pieces of nothing. Sounds like Hannibal. <laughs> um, so... Yeah. Um, I think there's some interesting Jarrett stuff because Jarrett is like, he's initially observing this and then I guess it's like in third person when they actually fight because Jarrett's not close enough to hear. Mm -hmm. um, and then we come back to Jarrett's point of view and he rescues Lyman. But mm -hmm. um, Jarrett observing before the fight is noticing Lyman um, standing aside from the battle and running no risks. And he thinks of him as Francis, um, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. he, he is, it seems at this point, he's seeing the real person a bit right um and he's right that Lyman is holding back and just like hunting Gabriel in this moment mm -hmm. um and then he um he finds him and I like this line um it was to the credit of Jarrett's heart if not of his good sense that in spite of the oncoming horsemen he swam on doggedly um and so he rescues Lyman so yeah. like oh go ahead well, I just to say, there, there's this line where it says he swam toward the fight that he knew he would never reach until it had ended one way or the other. And so it's like, there's a very good chance he will be unable to do anything, but he's swimming towards it anyway. And it just, I think this is a good, oh, Jarrett, you're such an idiot. But I have come around to the fact that he's a good guy. So, but I think this is a good example of his, of like the strengths of this character, which are, he is determined. And like, once he has a goal, like he does go towards that goal somewhat single-mindedly and he's trying to help. And even though the, the odds are low that he'll be able to be of benefit, he's going anyway. And I think there's some honor in him that even though he's thrown off the shackles of the order, he's cast it off, he's still trying to do everything in his power to save them from absolute destruction. Like before he goes to save Lyman, he almost gets himself killed trying to save Piero Strozzi, not Piero, Leone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually really telling. He fights with the knights like he's one of them. Like he mm -hmm. just jumps right back in, even though he's left the knights. He's, he's got a good heart. Um, 
so yeah, then the the Aga Morat, we have a little foreshadowing of the fact that he's going to save Lyman on 276 at the, the top of the page where he says, Allah, Allah preserve him. And I think you're initially thinking, oh, he's saying save Gabriel because, you know, Gabriel's on his side. Um, but then it's actually him peevishly ordering his men to put down their weapons and not kill Lyman. And Jarrett thinks the wages of sin, the wages of sin is life. Mm -hmm. And of course, he's so, like, it's not sin, you moron but yeah. um, and I mean obviously that's a flip on the actual quote which is that the wages of sin are death the wages of sin is death yeah. so he's um, yeah an irony yeah he's um, even Jarrett recognizes an irony here yeah um, yeah and I do after the side Jarrett says he's dead and I just wrote no because <laughs> that's ridiculous <laughs> Jarrett so a um, little, the little moment that I'm confused or have thoughts about is um, when they do go underwater and nobody really sees what happens. Is it possible that Gabriel slits his own wrists to make it look like he's dead to further his, you know, plans? Like, ah, if they think I'm dead, they won't see me the next time I'm coming along. I've never thought about that, but I don't think so because. Lyman believes that Gabriel's dead. And if he hadn't cut Gabriel's wrist himself, he would be, he'd be like, wait, it was a trick, right? And also it's yeah. a very serious injury. Yeah. I mean, there's also just the fact that they're underwater and things get muddled. You're not, you know, he may not be entirely sure what happened. I mean, you, you definitely have good points. But I definitely had a thought that Gabriel, maybe this is just Gabriel sort of play acting. I mean, he's definitely really injured, but. I mean, he could be I, play acting being unconscious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although even then you'd think he'd be like trying to get to shore to like patch up his wrists. I mean, the only thing I know for sure of in this moment is that he's not dead. <laughs> but I think it's really telling that Lyman was willing to die to kill him. Like the fact that Lyman was obviously like holding him down underwater so long that Lyman himself took a breath underwater and passed out. Like he was totally ready to die. Um, and and by killing Gabriel, he's doomed the children. So he probably is thinking that he deserves to die. Yeah. Oh yeah. So the last thing that Lyman says when he wakes up and gets back to himself um, is the children, said Francis Crawford. So the first thing he's thinking of is, I've killed Gabriel, the children, we have to save them. Um, and he says, oh, Mill, what hast thou ground? Um, and if you don't mind, I will read you what that's from. Yeah. All right, so Please. done it, companion. Um, so it's a fragment of Irish verse. Una, mother, child, one of the child Irish, makes sense. Um, the verse is, O mill, what hast thou ground, precious thy wheat. It is not oats thou hast ground, but the offspring of Kerval. The grain which the mill has ground is not oats, but blood red wheat, where the scions of the great tree Melorin's mill was fed. Um, and it says, the lament relates the death of Donna and Connell, sons of Blathma, who was one of the joint kings of ancient Ireland. Escaping from their enemies, Blathmach's two sons hid in the wheel shaft of a water mill owned by Maloran, son of Dima Cron. Their pursuers forced the woman in charge of the mill to open the sluice gates and let the water run. As the mill turned, the two brothers were crushed to death in its workings. So ancient Irish poetry of horror and death but sort of apt for this moment because it's about two innocent kids who get trapped in the circumstances and are destroyed because of it. Sort of innocence lost. It's like they have nothing to do with this plan, but they're just caught up in it. Yeah. She definitely found the perfect uh, quote for, for this moment. Also because of Una being Irish and it being Irish. Mm. All right, any other thoughts on this chapter? Oh. This one was a beast. Yeah. I really like their fight scene though, and I love how evil Gabriel is, and I find him still hilarious um, in an entertaining way, the way he talks to Lyman. 
How did we not know from the very beginning, Dee? I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's just uh, you know, kind of suspicious. Don, it's a very good writer, so we were yeah. suspicious, but like I was pretty suspicious of him from the beginning. <laughs> I don't know about you? It's very tricky though. She sets it up with a lot of ambiguity because I I was like super suspicious, and I was sure he was like, or I I'm sure I hated him, but I didn't know if I was supposed to hate him or if I was right, right, right. Yeah, I was like either he's horrible and bad and really 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 bad or he's being set up as some sort of like companion buddy kind of character or model and, or something yeah mentor character yeah. but he just felt so slimy from the beginning like been nearly I mean, you know how you read a lot of books, or you watch a lot of TV shows where there's like a very problematic character and the writer thinks that character is great and you're having this dissonant reaction where you're being taught to think that this, or you're being set up to think that this like awful abusive person is actually great and you end up yelling at your TV and throwing things and you stop watching. Like, yeah. I wasn't sure if Disorderly Nights was that or if right. I was supposed to hate him. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. Uh, but Dunnett earned my trust. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> problematic character is actually problematic. Yes, yeah. she knew it all along and she was doing it on purpose. I'm fine with that. Mm. All right, um, should we move on? Yeah. All right, chapter 15, Zakynthos and Aleppo. Um, so we start off back on the Dauphiné, which has been freed um, and uh, they're in Malta waiting uh, for Lyman and Jarrett to come back with the knights from the attack on Zuara. Um, and when they get back, um, Lyman has a plan that they have to save both children, and so they're going to split up, where Lyman, Nafrian, Salablanca, and Gautier go after the Zakynthos child on the Dauphiné, and Jarrett and Marta go after the other kid on the San Marco, I think, toward Aleppo. Thoughts on this section? Did we know before that Gautier and Marta are not actually related? that information that we had before because there's there's a line in the beginning of the chapter where it says her self-styled uncle glanced at so, so like oh he's not her uncle so I couldn't remember if we knew that before or not I don't remember if we knew yeah I just thought that was a nice little tidbit good, yeah good point um, um, and then Jared's going around telling everyone Gabriel's dead so we gotta save the kids yeah. Gabriel's dead Gabriel's dead and everybody believes him. It's yeah. not so much that he thinks Gabriel is dead. It's that other people just take his word for it. I mean, to be fair, like he's an experienced fighter. He ought to know when somebody's dead or not. Yes, but. Yeah. I love the tension between Jarrett and Marta. It's so great. <laughs> like they're just, it's, um, yeah. <laughs> he's like, I don't think I can care for her safety. <laughs> Um, and uh yeah we get um i think the first real in-depth look at why lyman has brought onofrian along mm -hmm. it's like if he if he comes with us it makes us look all the more important which can get us you know into behind yeah. doors that would have been shut to us it's like, it's like finally there's a reason for this guy <laughs> Because he's been super suspicious the whole time. I'm like, why is he there? But okay, maybe there's a reason. Um, I love that uh, Lyman <laughs> says to Jarrett, I require you, if you mean what you say about helping, to be a young ass in Aleppo, not Zakynthos. That cried me up so much. I know. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's and also Marta just digging at him about how he wants to stay with Mr. Crawford. It's just like, oh, Marta, stop. Um, I think it's also telling that after Lyman's O Mill, what hast thou ground, um, it says, and since then he had hardly spoken at all. And so we can extrapolate a lot from that. He's really upset. He's been thinking a lot about what to do because he pops out this whole plan. Um, and then it sets up this super contemplative section that's coming up where he's like really thinking through what to do about the children. Yeah. Also, it's interesting that Jarrett's about to blurt out that one of the children is Jolita and Gabriel's and Lyman stops him. 
from doing that. When Marta says like, are we led to believe that your mistress had twins? And Jarrett's like, well, and then Lyman's like, eh. <laughs> Why do you think Lyman uh, stops it? I mean, I think that that's, there's that generally, you know, culturally the child would be perceived with huge amounts of suspicion and derision and, and you know, just discriminated against and, and all that. And so yeah. he stops it. I, there may be more to it than that, but. No, but it makes perfect sense. You wouldn't want word to get out that a child is the incest baby of a super villain. Yeah. <laughs> that would be terrible for a child. <laughs> that seems not good. Yeah. yeah, he's already looking for the, you know, future well-being of his child, which speaks pretty highly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then we have a very brief section where Marta, Jarrett, Anafian, and Salvanka, I think, um, talk about the situation. Um, super brief, just gonna catch up. Um, thoughts on this? Um, my one big takeaway from this point is the final thing that Gautier says. And I'm like, why the hell are you even on this journey? Which of course, he's just here for the spin it. He's got nothing. Yeah, I think he's just on, he's but. just doing kind of thing. Ugh, I kind of wanted to slap yeah. him. So he's just like, his opinion is, well, if you can't tell which one it is, you should just let them both die. Mm -hmm. like, ooh. But I think he's speaking the, like, he's giving the common view, right? He, he, the, you know, the, the view of the day would be that the only valuable child is the one that's blood related to you and to raise, you know, a cuckoo baby, you know, like a, a mistaken baby would be a disaster of huge proportions. So it's better to just let them both die and then have another kid, you know? And one of them's a bastard anyway. So it's yeah. not like, it's not like you're a legitimate child you'd be letting die. He's just a bastard kid. And then there's a incest bastard kid. And so just let them both die and have another kid would be the, the commonly held view. So it's, like, yeah, it's gross. Like, it's a gross attitude, but I also think he's speaking the sort of thoughts of the day, probably. Yeah. Actually reminds me that in the earlier chapter with Philippa, she called the child she was looking for a child of love. Is that just a nice way of saying bastard? Oh, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Euphemistically, yeah. Mm -hmm. Philippa and her recurring motif about love and kindness. Mm -hmm. um, I think also it's interesting, again, we have Lyman referred to as a machine. Does the machine not make festival when the great Gabriel is dead? Um, she's talking about like, how come we're not celebrating? And it's like, we are not going to celebrate when uh, you just possibly got two kids dead. Yeah. All right. Any other thoughts on this little section? Yeah, other than the little, um, Marta does tell Lyman earlier that she's going to bring Jarrett back to him weaned so just implying that Jarrett's a baby <laughs> which again I love she's not entirely wrong that's the thing she's, <laughs> she's talking about Jarrett she's got a point she is not entirely wrong oh my goodness um so our next section uh starts out with Sala Blanca um finding out some more information about the Zakynthos child um strongly indicating that it's Jolita's um, and then we have this really interesting, rare Lyman point of view where he contemplates what to do about the children. Um, before we get into both of those things, one of the things I thought was really interesting was um, Salablanca, well, just in general, like the observation of how all the characters are responding um, uh, to Lyman, like efficiently taking back over the ship. And you've got Anafrian, it, it was, to Anafran, it was what he expected in any man he distinguished by serving. And to Gautier, it was another manifestation of the loudish physical world, which so often insulted the sensitive man and his art. The world to which, with pleasure, he lent money at exorbitant interest. So this is just a little short section here about how they're reacting to Lyman running the boat is like so telling about the characters and what matters to them. And I love her just like her like contempt for Gautier that she like subtly puts in here. Yeah, it's such a legit like um, depiction of a character that he thinks he's this arty connoisseur and he's so much more sensitive than everyone else. And actually, he's just a jerk. Yeah, just a jerk. Yes. Oh, and then we find out that uh, Donati randomly killed himself 
not like Gabriel's, murder. Yeah, right, not like Gabriel's covering his tracks by killing literally everyone involved. Right. Uh, I kind of wonder how many times I'm going to write murder out on the margins of this book. <laughs> like, it was actually murder. Murder. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so Philippe, to your point about the ambiguity about the children, um, there is the line at the bottom of 285, um, a faint spirit half slipped betwixt the skin and the flesh till they sent him to Prince Dragoots to recover. Then in October came back the same Kuzukayam, beautiful and bright in the color of his body and energetic and firm in his soul. So it's super ambiguous because it's like, oh, he came back much healthier. So maybe he's different. But then it says literally the same Kuzukayam from someone who'd seen him before. So maybe it is the same child. Yeah, and they like, did send him there to get better. So he came back better. So yeah. I think we're meant to no. sort of be yeah. ambiguous about these two children until we know an answer for sure. So. But I, I definitely her? think, I definitely think that this the Zakynthos child is the Gabriel. Oh, I can't say Jobriel anymore now that we have a name. Yeah. Darn it, Kuzakayim, <laughs> um, and Karedin is the one that they've been searching for in uh, along the coast of Africa. So, but who knows for sure? Only done it, or everybody else that's read this book. Is, you know. <laughs> everybody. <else. laughs> except for you and me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a little bit about Donati too, where it says like, so, I think this is in Sala Blanca's point of view, maybe. Yeah, um, in like so, yeah it's, it's just like she was the, she was Duenna, they said to the child, the child who was brought to the bed of the boy, a poor Duenna, thou sayest, who permits her jewel to be ravished so young. A child the mother was with hair the color of apricots stunning in june so that's i mean obviously julita and this bit about like donati i mean you do have to wonder like she what was going on with her because if she was you know if she loved julita and was loyal to julita and had been part of julita's life for years and years and yet was powerless to stop the abuse from Gabriel and had to sort of stand by while Jolita was violated and destroyed and, and all that. Like, you kind of got to wonder. I have a lot of sympathy with her. I, it's funny because um, Jared, I think, thought the same thing about her when he found out about Jolita's pregnancy. But like, what really could, you, could this woman have done against yeah. Gabriel? Like, all you could actually do in that position is take care of Delita as best you can and don't get killed. Like yeah. you try to go against Gabriel, you're gonna die. Yeah, support support her as best as possible and try and mitigate as many problems as possible. And yeah, it's not her fault that she couldn't save Jolita. I mean, Jolita was a mess. Like at least Jolita yeah. had one person in her life that cared about her. Yeah. Um, also telling again that we're reminded about her hair, the color of apricots. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, I mean, I think that's just saying that this definitely was Kuzakayam until they sent him away. And then that's where the ambiguity lies, so. But then we get that peach jam and the Jolita mm -hmm. apricot reminder and it's like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, if I'm one still of like, these kids ends up with strawberry blonde hair, <laughs> that's definitely gonna be a sign. <laughs> I'm wondering how much older Kuzakayam is than Karadin. He's at least a year old. We know yeah. that Jolita had to have had him a couple months at least before she got on the boat to go to Scotland because she was already a couple months pregnant at that point when she had the abortion on the ship. Yeah, so. he's at least a year older, if not more. And the kid in, um, the kid here speaks. Yeah. Like says, so which makes, and I can't, did the other kid speak? Or just gesture. He spoke, but not as much. Yeah. yeah. So it makes me feel like maybe this kid is older. Ish. It's also no. really it's really hard to tell because they also one seems like oh, much more taken care of than the other. Like Donati was right. taking care of this kid, and no one was really taking care of the other. So it could also be like malnutrition. You know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's true. They're just feeding the other kid alcohol and. Ugh. Oh, it makes me sad. Um, um, I love this moment at the bottom of 286 where um, 
Lyman is thinking and he says, um, let them both die. Gautia had said that, or so Jared had told him in his voice, in his voice meant to be overheard. But what of the child? Marta had said had said that and Philippa too, but only Philippa he thought had meant it. And Philippa had made no vow at St. Giles. And so just this, he's just thinking of like Philippa's determination to save this kid. Um, this is one of my favorite Lyman point of view sequences in the whole series because it mm -hmm. um, it's like explicitly contrasting him with Gautier and Jarrett and comparing him with Philippa where he's thinking about how Gautier would say to kill them both and Jarrett would think about you know doing everything possible to figure out which was which and here's Philippa ready to sacrifice for the child and he's thinking about what what he would do um and I, i've read like i've read multiple i've had many analyses of this scene and some people don't like lyman here some people think he's being too um mechanical in his thinking not following like the parental instinct right because what he thinks is both children equally deserve to live um and it, and it even says um it was a theory that cut across every natural instinct mm -hmm. um but then there's this moment about he thinks if you were who you were and it's like he and i think it's a combination of logic and emotion is looking at it logically like why should my why should this other child be less worthy of life than my child um you know neither child was malformed or mentally maimed um gabriel's son had escaped the physical risks of his heritage other taints it might be had escaped him as well what was original sin um, who could say then that more than his own Gabriel's house might not hold the potential of genius? Like, that's a pretty surprising thing to think about the child of your enemy. Like, wouldn't your natural instinct be that, like, this man has horribly, you know, killed someone I loved and tortured me and I don't want his child to live? But instead, Lyman is like, no, this child is innocent and he is equally deserving. That's unusual. The key, the key section here for me, which made me just love Lyman in this scene and I don't think he's being mechanical at all like I don't know I don't know who's saying that I think they're that's ridiculous <laughs> I think he is thinking things through but I think as we think through like I obsessively think about things that are important to me all the time like that's that's what we do as people it's this it's the paragraph it's like a third of the way down the page where um, it says, but Gabriel was dead. As a man, this child would be one's offering to the future races of men. The burden of his upbringing, wherever it fell, however tiresome or onerous, was of no importance compared with his living grasp of the future. This one felt of one's son. Was it not also true of Gabriel's? And it's just this idea that children are children <laughs> like the fact that this like if this is true of my child it is also true of gabriel's child and that lyman is not seeming to place more value on a child because it's blood related to him but just seeing value in children who are at risk and i love that mm -hmm. yeah. um i agree and it's interesting he also pointed out um this child this unknown son of his blood was worth one life his own mm -hmm. um, so is the other child worth his life too like i don't know what his what you think he's thinking there yeah and i do think when he says like a theory that cut across every natural instinct i think that's a condemnation of the natural instinct <laughs> like like i think it's a it's a way of saying that 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 way of thinking isn't good and that it, it's Lyman because of who he is he's caring for others whether they're related to him or not and he's caring for the vulnerable and the weak and the oppressed and yeah Lyman is way too progressive for his own society <laughs> yeah. by the way um and Jared who's our more like conventional morality is um you would fret cut your soul to distinguish the one from the other and then crush Gabriel's son like a leech beneath the sole of your foot. And Lyman you, would never. Do you think Jarrett would do that though? Do you think Jarrett would take the life of an innocent child? I don't think, I don't see that. I don't think he would kill the kid, but I don't think he would raise the kid as his own. 
no, I like go out of his way to save the kid, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. All right. Whereas Lyman definitely seems to be thinking here, like, I need to save both of them. And they've split up to save both of them now, but they don't know which is which. But even if they do save both of them, it's not like he's going to put, from at least what we read here, he's not going to make a big effort to ferret out which is which. Like, he believes he needs to save both of them regardless. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it that seems like if they save both of them, they're both going to go together wherever. Like, if, if some miracle happens and they save both kids and they end up going back to Scotland, like Lyman's going to take both kids. Like, I don't think he's going to. Don't have Annie Stabila to watch them. Yeah. I don't think he's like going to dump his, this other kid in some random city and just be like, so long, four year old child. <laughs> well, and also telling that he knows Philippa has also like is sacrificing the same kind of way that he believes he should sacrifice and so i think what she's doing is going to weigh in as well um i also like so there's a clarification of what he said at the beginning where he said think of it not as a child but as a pawn he had said that himself once to jared because he knew god he knew jared's terrible romanticism which would taste death so readily so splendidly offer the blood of his fellows in defense of the weak and the puny so he never believed that. He said that to Jarrett to get Jarrett to not, you know, readily sacrifice himself. Yeah. <laughs> to try and get Jarrett not to be as dumb as he usually mm -hmm. is. Because remember at the beginning, he was trying to push Jarrett away and push Philip away and be like, don't come. Yeah. But of course, the whole time he's been planning to save the kid. Um, and I also like it says right before this section, before Salablanca, Francis Crawford did not always school his expression. Like even though Salablanca is kind of functioning as his servant, Salablanca is also like the closest person to him at this point and kind of the only person he trusts to like see his genuine emotions. Yeah. He's trustworthy. I really hope he remains trustworthy. I don't want him to become a bad character. Oh, I don't think that'll happen. Surely yeah. not. I hope not. I like him a lot. Um, so the last bit I wanted to mention in this section is something Salabanca says where they're talking about the Quran and he says a quote from it, which is, you have the appointment of a day from which you cannot hold back any while, nor can you bring it on before it is time. Mm -hmm. Thoughts on that? Isn't that referencing death? I would like, assume so. Yeah. So like the day of our death is set and there's nothing we can do to delay or hasten it. And why does yeah. he say that then? I mean, I think it's fatalistic. It's like what will happen will happen. And we will, you know, we will do our best to, you know, it's kind of like we're going to do our best to save these children and to thwart these plans. But what what is in place is in place and what will happen will happen. And yeah. Yeah. But he's mad about it because <laughs> he gets irritated. He gets irritated. He says, like, blessed be all the prophets and praise be to God, the Lord of both worlds, says Lyman with a sudden sharp irritability. And then, yeah, they're super right. So for the last few sections, um, basically we have, uh, we're back to uh, Jared and Marta. Um, they have, I'll just summarize all three sections quickly. They talk about who Kiaia Hatun is and what her goals are. Um, they they go on the pe they go after the peppercorn toward Aleppo. Um, they make each other miserable. <laughs> um, Jared <laughs> drinks too much. Um, they survive an attack by raiders, and Marta reveals that she's a Muslim. Surprise! Mm -hmm. Shocker. <laughs> um, yeah, thoughts on these three short sections? Yeah, I. <laughs> Okay, we just got to look at this section on 288 where, um, okay, so Jarrett says he's come to terms with how like frustrated he is with Lyman. He says one man can make him feel and act like a rhinoceros and a cloud of mosquitoes. Marta had perhaps, qu not perhaps quite the purely detached ability to hurt, which Lyman exercised with such care, but with Marta in every other way, it was far, far worse. The eyes, the mouth, the brain, the body through which she exp expressed her indifference and her contempt were those of a woman he wanted. A woman high, cool, remote as a cloud forest, trailing mosses and bright birds and orchids, a woman with a body like moonlight seen through a pearl curtain. That's poetic. 
I mean, a pearl curtain, a woman whom he had not touched since her sardonic blue eyes studying him. She had said, you only want me because for the thousandth time, Jarrett shut his mind to that episode he had work to do. <laughs> it's just like, oh, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, my take on this is he's head over heels in love with Lyman and husband for a long time. He's sublimating it now into Marta. And now I would say he is legitimately head over heels in love with Marta, um, except that they have nothing in common and she can't stand him and it's moronic, but it's Jarrett. <laughs> that feels on brand for Jarrett. Yeah. And I kind of feel bad for Marta. Like she's, you know, she's not being very nice to him, but also like she just really seems super uninterested. Also, I think she's super aware that he's massively, like, I think she's very aware that she is a substitute for him, for Lyman, and that's got to be annoying. Like, hurtful. Yeah, it's actually yeah. hurtful. Like, you don't want me, yeah. you want someone else, and, like, it's hurtful right. that you're, like, you think you want me when you don't. I'm like, yeah. yeah, I'm your second choice and, like, an inferior choice, and, like, that's not, <sighs> Yeah. I mean, especially hurtful if she has any feelings towards him in return, which I don't think she does, but. Right. But, yeah. but it also sort of makes sense that she has an inferiority complex about Lyman because she's like the bastard sister. He was raised with, you know, the gentry and she's raised in, you know, no, no title or anything like that in poverty or has to work for a living. I really and we want don't have a sense that she more has of her story. Yeah, like we don't have a sense that she has a family or at least any, I mean, obviously she has family, but but we don't get a sense that she has anyone who loves her, you know? And whereas Lyman has Sibylla and Richard is <laughs> as many issues as they have, like they do love each other. And yeah, so I miss but, Richard. Oh, where, where Marta has Gautier, like what's fun? Uh, it's um, terrible. Um, so I do, I did love this bit from Richard, I mean, from Richard, from <laughs> oh my gosh, Jarrett, where um, he says, uh, he watched the pilgrims in their boxes disembark and set up across the dazzling sea. If you have faith, you don't need the trappings, he said. And I think that's an interesting commentary on his journey with faith so far, where because when he was with the knights, like, it's all about the trappings, you know, there's this ceremonies and mass and they wear these outfits and it's very prescribed and all this stuff and faith is very much about things you do and things you wear and places you go and and so just this comment of that you don't need that to have faith which yeah liked but then of course Martha gets snarky about <laughs> she gets about everything um, yeah. what did you make of their exchange about Kiaya Hatoum So what is going on with Marta? Like, because her response to her, that name was so strong that Jarrett noticed, which. And caught his breath at the look on her face. Yeah, like that's gotta be some pretty strong reaction if he's gonna pick up on it. Cause you know. Cause it's Jarrett. He's completely oblivious. So yeah and it says then it changed and her lashes covered her eyes so she had some sort of visceral response to this name and we know they know each other and have known each other for a while um i don't know well she would have met her in the dom's house probably yeah we know that they've been acquainted and they talked like when they were in whatever the other place was yeah, <laughs> yeah. so we know that they know each other but um i don't know maybe she sees this woman is like something she could have been or could be because she talks about how powerful she is and how like well you know she's she's a powerful woman she's a friend here she's the wife of the sultan beloved of Dragut. Uh, they say uh nobody knows who she is you know i don't know maybe she's jealous of her or envious of her power i don't know or maybe there's something more well, she seems to think pretty quickly that um, 
you know, she calls Jared out and be like, surely you were attracted to her. No, I felt no attraction. Well, that was because perhaps the magnet was turned in another direction. So another sort of dig sort of at his attraction for Lyman, but. Oh, I, I think, thought it was saying that that she was attracted to Lyman, that she was attracted to Lyman, like that her magnet was in another direction, not his. Or she was trying to lure Lyman. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, I thought she was saying that he wasn't attracted to her because she wasn't trying. <laughs> yeah, that like she's a magnet and whoever she turns her magnet at, it falls for her. Oh, I see, I thought, <laughs> I thought that was just another dig at Jared <laughs> being in love with Lyman. You're super gay and that's why you didn't like the lady. <laughs> I mean, it could be read as both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it could. Uh, um, yeah, I think there's like a few things in here about, um, so Marsh says, I do not intend that the needy should look to me for their banquet. And Jarrett says, to Kiaia Hatoon then. Um, and she says, Francis Crawford has much to answer for, hasn't he? I break what is thine because thou corruptest what is mine. Um, I don't know how to, I don't want to see any spoilers, but like, I feel like there's definitely an implication here that um, she's, Kiai Hatun is using her attractiveness toward Lyman to get something that she wants from him, or at least she's trying. Well, my question here is, so she says, Francis Crawford has much to answer for, doesn't he? So then the question is, well, what did he do? Like, what is it specifically that she's referring to that he needs to answer for? And I don't think that's clear here. Um, and then I break what is thine because thou corruptest what is mine. So does that mean Francis corrupted something of hers? Did he do, you know, so she's going to break something of his because he corrupted something of hers? Is she gonna, um, is she gonna mess with Jared because Lyman took something of hers? Yeah, and then and then immediately says you are wrong. Kiaya Katun makes her own paradise. So then, does that mean there's something broken or corrupted from her stance as well? You know, like is she doing something to break or corrupt something else? Like, well, and we're also told. Um, Mr. Crawford has need to look out for she will choose and brittle her deer if it pleases her. Um, mm -hmm. And then this whole thing about um, the, the night lamp and how um, the water bull brings his jewel with him in his mouth and sets it down in the place where he would graze and by the light of it, he doth graze. She is the lamp and should she come to him, he may graze where he pleases. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's very telling when she had that whole exchange with him about all the stuff happening in the, in the world. And then we hear all this stuff about how she is super powerful in all these places that she goes. And then this idea that she is the lamp and like she can, she can connect with powerful men as a way of like amplifying their power, but also amplifying her own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if she, like if she involves herself with a man, his, yeah, his power is expanded and he can quote graze where he pleases. I guess. And then it's interesting. It was then in bewildered understanding and pity that Jarrett, so then it seems like Jarrett's like, oh, she feels bad about this. So I should touch her, <laughs> like give her a hug or something. That was not, like, he made the error of touching her. Like, oh she no. Turned on him a light malice. Yeah. I just had a thought as we were talking about this, and it may be silly, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. We've been thinking throughout this whole book, you know, it's titled The Pawn and Frankincense, that the, the children are the pawns that we're playing. But what if the pawns are actually Lyman and his crew in a game between the Dame de Dutants and Kia Khatun? Because they Gabriel. set this whole thing in motion. And Gabriel. Yeah, if he's a part of it as well. Yeah. Like or who, gave who really is the pawn, or is, is there multi levels of pawns going on here? Are Gabriel and Lyman pawns in someone else's game? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah, 100%. Like, Kiaia Hatun and, and the Dom Dijon sent Phil Philippa on this mission, mm -hmm. like, as their pawn. And Gabriel okay. keeps sending Lyman around like his pawn. But definitely, I think there's multiple pawns. Yeah. I mean, if we think about chess, like, there's more, there's more, um, pieces than pawns you know so like if you know if Gabriel and 
and Lyman are knights on the board and and the Dom de Detents and Kaya Hatum are queens on the board, you know, and, and the children are pawns and, you know, Philip is a rook, like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I mean, just thinking about like which pieces have power and which pieces do unexpected things. And, and the pawn I think is an interesting piece because if it goes to the other side of the board, it changes into a more powerful piece. So mm -hmm. like, what does that happen? You know, is that part of this story in some way? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Like, cause we have Philippa starting out like a pawn, but we see her growing. Is she always gonna be a pawn? Yeah. True. Um, I just love this description of Jared's day, which is like emblematic of this section. Then he returned to the con, ate a leaded meal of mutton and rice, quarreled with Marta, and retiring to his mattress, drank himself into a nightmarish sleep punctuated by the howling of jackals. This road trip sucks, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're Jared's not happy. Not having a good time. Uh, poor guy. Um, and also, I just love the whole thing about how Jarrett, who had perfect self-control in the uh, previous book, and how he just so completely doesn't. <laughs> like, F it all! <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm going to get drunk again. Um, so I do, it is sort of interesting, though, that that's the vice he picks. Like, obviously, he's self-medicating everything, you know, but, but he doesn't seem to be, like, finding women in every port or men, you know, he doesn't seem to be like swearing a lot or doing, you know, like whatever other vices we can think of, like, but he's just drowning himself with alcohol. <laughs> oh, I find him very entertaining, but annoying, but entertaining. Um, so we have a whole bunch of information about opium. Yeah. Mm -hmm opium fields and the Janissaries um, who are all apparently taking opium um, and how this flabs of opium get adulterated as they get sold. And then we end with this sort of awful comment from Marta. Um, Have you ever seen a man starve in order to buy himself a hundred grains daily and then be deprived of his source? That isn't an insult. That is the root of the tree that grows in the bottom of hell, which is true. Uh, opium addiction is horrible. Yeah. Why is that in here? I mean, it's sort of a much larger level of addiction than the addictions that we've seen so far, where Lyman's certainly had his vices with alcohol and now Jared's going through it as well. I think there's also a thing with opium where it comes from this beautiful poppy flower like we and we had that little art scene with the poppies and it, it seems so innocent and yet it it creates this you know horror horrible suffering for people mm -hmm. um and i feel like that's a theme in this book is like corrupted innocence and the opium is a great like thematic um element that relates to that it and also sounds uh, like Monta may have some experience or some sort of back history with this because of the way she treated that opium uh the poppy painting she ripped it into shreds like maybe that's telling of some larger issue that she had in the past yeah and there's there's also a couple, there's a couple more symbolic things about it too where it's it's something that people use to escape but it makes your life worse you know so like people often you know try to escape into an opium haze you know but it's it doesn't help and then also there's there's a sense where in it can be used for good like it can be medicinal and useful but is often not so then like how do we see things that are potential there's potential for good but they're corrupted you know back to that idea of corruption and and destruction and right exactly and this child of gabriel and jolita who is an innocent but could be carrying this like danger of corruption. Mm. Um, so then we have Jarrett in typical Jarrett form going, if the trail ends here, it ends and I go back to France. My God, I'm a soldier, not a wet nurse to somebody's bastard. Considering he spends like this entire book going, I'm gonna leave now and doesn't, I'm not taking that. <laughs> I do not believe he will be doing that. <laughs> Uh, at, at best, he'll go herring off to wherever he thinks Lima is, <laughs> like, if anything. 
Um, so then the rest of this chapter is taken up with Marta's revelation that she's a Muslim, um, which I think is really interesting, her reasons for it, which are mm -hmm. that Western society pretends that in her position as a, a woman who's a bastard that she has you know, free will and can make her own way, but actually doesn't give her those opportunities. And basically saying that this Islamic society accepts that she has little choice and doesn't pretend. Um, and then there's also this thing that she doesn't mention Roxalana or Kiaya Hatun. Roxalana is the, um, the wife of Suleiman who is extremely powerful. So this idea that actually in this culture, even though it um, isn't necessarily the most empowering for women, that women can rise super high and be very powerful in it. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's just another sign of, of Dunnett's, uh, the way that she writes about these religious conflicts and, and cult cultural differences and all of that, where she's not placing moral value on one or the other. And she's not like, she's not saying that um, Christianity or Islam or, you know, Mediterranean culture, North African culture, European culture, I think is inherently better. Like there's just this running theme throughout it all that people are people that humanity is humanity and the, the different cultural, the cultural differences that we all have are both good and bad, beautiful and horrific, you know, and there's this like one side does these horrible, terrifying things and the other side does these horrible, terrifying things. And yeah. Yeah, agreed. I think she's like, I think there's some sort of like racist tropes that slip in through these books because they were written in the sixties. But I think what her intention is, is what you just said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think Dunnett is a product of her time and space. So she's not gonna do this perfectly, but I think that she really did a pretty incredible job for, yeah. Um, interestingly, Jarrett, um, Marta's like, you think this is blasphemy. And Jarrett replies, you're leaving a c civilization which rules by the intellect for a civilization which rules by the senses, said Jarrett. <laughs> and you would dissuade me, <laughs> said Marta. <laughs> so funny there's no one who lives by more by the senses and less by the intellect <laughs> and Art is just like and you are the one who's gonna tell me not to do that oh, yeah. no i love and, it and it's such a like if you know even the slightest bit about you know muslim culture and history and stuff like the idea that 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 culture is not ruled by the intellect is completely ridiculous because you know there's so much science and math and 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 all of that that comes out of of their history and so it's it's like there's it, even a surface look at that quote just shows that jared is speaking from his bias and his well and look at the the all the internal politics of the Knights of St. John that we saw where there's like epitome of Christianity and there's no intellect driving what they do. It's all politics and personality. Pride. Yeah, pride. Mm -hmm. Greed. Barbarism, misogyny. Power. Um, which is also on, I mean, which is it's in all sides, you know, like this is driven by pride, driven by a desire for power. Yeah, it's yeah. not saying that like one or the other is more yeah. like it's just saying that every culture has its good sides and its bad sides and its complexity. Exactly. All right. So um, interesting setup here. We've got now three different trajectories. We've got Philippa on her way to join the harem. Um, oh. We don't know for sure which baby's which. What do you think is going to happen? <laughs> it's all open from here. I don't know. Like. Yeah. We'll follow all three of them to the conclusion. I think they're all going to come together at the end and what, well, they're headed to Constantinople. So that seems to be the place they're going. And guess who's waiting for them there? The zombie of Gabriel, because he's dead. Don't forget. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, I am 
really looking forward to the scene where Lyman finds out that Philippa is in the Sultan's harem. Oh, <laughs> like, God. However he discovers this, I really hope that there's a whole scene about it because I want to read it. So I will be sad if that happens off stage because that's, that's going to be nuts. Um, yeah. What else? I mean, Gabriel's obviously not dead. Mm. Um, I don't think they're going to find either of the children before Constantinople. I think the searches are all going to lead them there. So, yeah, I would be surprised if Jared and Marta find their kid. Well, and then go I to mean, Constantinople. Like, that seems weird. Philip has already found one of them, so she's with him, but she's got no choice but to go to Constantinople with that child now. So. It's on the other two to find the children. We'll see. Yeah. Anything you're really um, hoping for or hoping won't happen? Um, I'm like really to... Sorry, go ahead. I, was say, I want to find out what's going on with the Dame du Détente and Gautier and Marta, that whole situation like what the relationship is between Gaia, Katun, and the Dante Dutons. I hope we find that out. I'd really like it if everybody makes it out of the book alive, but I know that's not going to happen. So. <laughs> I mean, there are some characters I don't care if they die. I don't care if Gautier, die, Gautier dies. Well, no. I, I mean the ones that I, you know. Right. I just core, want. Well, his core group. Yeah, our core group. So Lyman, Jarrett, Philippa, Marta. The two kids. I would like those six characters to make it out of life. Archie. Seven. Salabanca. Salabanca. Okay. <laughs> now we're just adding characters to the list. Okay, that's it. Eight. If those eight characters make it out, I'll be happy. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, any final thoughts you guys want to share? Um, I actually kind of really miss Adam Blacklock. I hope he comes back at some oh, point. Yeah. <laughs> I just I was thinking about him randomly today. I was like, oh, I forgot about him. Where's he been? I forgot about him. Yeah. Somewhere in France. He's part of the the St. Mary's army that nobody really knows what's happened to them. But are, are we gonna have a point, not in this book, but in another book where we have to go like dig the St. Mary's crew out of some sort of disaster that they've gotten themselves into? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, no is... Lyman, no Jarrett. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I agree. I, I miss Adam Blacklock. And I miss I miss Richard. I miss Sevilla. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, like the whole um, Marietta, like, you know. It's like we get them every other book. We get uh, my family every other book. One, three, maybe next book. Maybe next book. But definitely in the last one, if they all make it. Uh, <laughs> the next one is the Ring Castle. Yeah. So maybe that's a European based one. Maybe we're back to Scotland. I want to see what happens in this book before trying to figure out what the next one's about, but. Yeah. <laughs> I do always miss Richard. I love his and Lyman's dynamic. Although I think you get something similar with Jarrett, except with Jarrett, it's like a more like romantic infatuation. Whereas with Richard, it's not, it's just that they really love each other as brothers. Yeah. Um, I feel like Richard has a lot more exasperation <laughs> with Lyman, which I like. I like the. Mm. I like the like push pull with Jared and Richard, you know, of the they love each other, but they drive each other crazy and with Lyman and Richard. Lyman and Richard, yeah. Sorry, what did I say? You said Jared and Richard. I was like, I said yeah. Lyman and Richard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lyman and Richard. They oh, love they each did. other. They they meet. Yes. Yeah. Um, I hope Kevin gets to meet his cousins. Yeah. Yeah. His cousins. <laughs> Kevin Karetin Kuzakoyum. Oh boy. That's a mouthful. Alliteration. Yeah. It would be interesting to have Adam on this road trip. I feel like he would be more of a calming influence, though, and I kind of like how messy it is. Yeah. Get lots of inspiration for his sketches. So many beautiful things to sketch. Sure. All right. Any other thoughts you guys want to share? Nope. Looking forward to the next journey. All right. Well, Thank you then everyone for watching. Goodbye. Bye.